Welcome to the Elk Season Podcast. This is episode number 10. The Elk Season Podcast is dedicated to archery elk, the greatest outdoor sport in North America. I am Harold Chambers. I'm David Chambers. And today, what are we talking about? We're talking about all kinds of things, actually. So we have uh, a book you want to bring up uh, called The Loop. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to be talking about some trail tales, pardon the... I don't have a better name for it, so we're just trail rolling tales. with that. Trail Tales. D- yeah, so- stories from the game trail. Sounds like a Nickelodeon bit. Okay. Ga- game Trail Tales? <laughs> trail Tales. Uh, anyways. Uh, like, uh, okay. El- uh, elk Season, the movie. Yes, we could talk about... You really want to talk about that more? You think well, that's I, worth exploring? Well, I didn't know if you wanted to talk about. Okay, we can, we can just scratch that off. Okay, so well, may, maybe next time. So there's a little. What would we call a little uh, teaser trailer? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Do we want to ruin elk season? Uh, yeah. Not really. So more I on that. Like it. More on that later. Uh, and then conservation news. Plenty. Plenty to talk about every week. Just seems like it just doesn't stop showing up in the news. Stuff, yeah. Stuff related to our endeavors in the outdoors. Yeah. So there's and there's lots of stuff. Um, this week we had, uh, uh, and Oh, destination elk. Oh, destination. Elk. <laughs> Hold on. So that, that replaces, uh, yeah. So destination that, elk that replaces of, elk season, the movie. Yeah. There we go. Which in a way it's its own movie with many, many sequels. Yeah, it is. Yeah. There was two episodes this week. One was 16 minutes. One was 46. And and I haven't been doing it, but a couple, uh, they're, they're throwing out some bonus footage with yeah. guys doing gear dumps, gear which dumps. aren't. You know, when it comes to understanding a, a sport, understanding a process of something, it's good to see what other people are doing. And I watched Randy Newberg do a, yeah. a gear dump on his channel many, many years ago. Yeah. And so uh, I'll get to those. Did eventually. you like the gear? Did you watch the gear dump? Uh, I didn't watch the gear oh, dumps okay. from Elk uh, Elk One Hundred One. Okay. I watched a, a gear dump from Randy a while back. Yeah. And I took notes. I actually have stuff in my uh, Amazon car, uh, wish list. Okay. Of things okay. like like certain uh, game bags, which. I honestly don't know. I, I haven't bought them because I don't know that I, again, confidence <laughs> issue. Maybe that's what I got to work on. Am I going to even get something yeah. to put in those game bags? Yeah. So, so who knows? So, so let me ask you this real quick. Um, what, any, at any given day, you you unzip the tent to go out hunting. Yeah. What, what do you feel like your chances are? Any given day. Any given day. Yeah. Um, I let can I answer first? Yeah. A hundred percent. Every day I feel a hundred percent positive. Today's the day. It's gonna happen for me. Every day. I now I, I was gonna I stall balance. myself into the same kind of answer. I I balance that with might not be today, but I have to be ready every single day. Yeah. And so and so I think about you know the the odds the archery elk success rates on harvesting are ten percent. It's a ninety percent fail rate, and yet somehow every time I unzip the tent, I go, "Today's the day, man! Hundred percent. I know, I know something could happen today." Yeah. yeah. And there have been times where it's boring, 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 and then <gasps> action, action, I action. Can't, I can't breathe because yeah. it's stuff is happening so quickly, and it could be. I remember one morning I told you, hey, we could be 15 minutes away from gutting an elk. Yeah. And in and 10 minutes later, I think you had a shot. Pretty close. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Was that that spike? Yeah. 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 And, and it was interesting because uh, we, we've gotten more, Im- I wouldn't say emboldened, but more confident with doing setups and getting yes. so once we see them and pursuing. Yeah. Because there's a lot of unknowns that we have to overcome as, as first gens. Yeah. And so get, gaining more and more experience. But that day was kind of interesting because we we watched where he was feeding and he went he went over that little knoll and then we came in, set up, and there he was. Yeah. And and I had some very <laughs> very and, and you know, every season I bring it up. It's kind of like, yeah. It's like uh, I don't know. It's like, I don't know if it's an old man syndrome. It's like, oh yeah, I remember that year. I didn't get that spike. Yeah. yeah. But I should have had this in my hand. I should have done that. Shoulda, shoulda, shoulda. And what do you always say about that? Don't should on each other. Yeah, let's not should on let's, ourselves. Let's not should on ourselves. Yeah. So, so. Uh, mental note: What do I do differently <laughs> next time? And what's really cool about what I was, what, what I beat myself up for on that particular spike, I, I, I see guys in Elk One Hundred and One doing exactly what 
I've been meaning to do. And so they'll have certain elements like the, the range finder is handy yeah. and it's not laying on the ground. And, you know, it just with experience, time, time. Heals. So, yeah, going on like a 3D shoot, which you've never done together. Have yeah. you ever done one? I have. Yeah. I have. There was a, a great range up in uh, Pocatello. I yeah. went uh, with my old bow. So our, our, <laughs> they, nice. a bunch of buddies in Pocatello are like, we're going out to the range. And I was like, cool, I'll go. But I'm like, I have this old bow. They're like, oh, we don't care. And it's like, you know, a 1980s. Right, bear. Uh, bear. Yeah, they look uh, at it and they go, oh, you mean old bow. Coincidentally, though, I I was pretty, I was fairly accurate with it yeah. that day. So. Uh, I wasn't accurate any other time. <laughs> Good for but, you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it was, uh, I think, two years later we we upgraded. But yeah, uh, there's a 3D bow, I believe. There used to be one over here near Durkee's Lake. Yeah, yeah, there still and, is. And we went out. And But uh, yeah. the one I really wanted to go to is out by um, City of Rocks. Oh, really? There's one out there? Yeah. Really? That sounds fun. It's, I believe it, it's been out there and it's Fish and Game commissioned even. So it's okay. like, it's, I don't okay. know. I'll have to look into I'll update on that. I'm pretty sure though. All it's, right. it's a little bit of a drive, but it. We need to be doing some driving. We yeah. need to get some miles in. We need We need a Saturday. Yeah. We need to get out there. I mean, it's, it's coming up close end of March. Yeah. We're going to be in hurricane season. This, March and April is what I call hurricane season here in Idaho. Because of the wind. Yeah. And if, if the wind is going to be bad that day, let's not go. Yeah. Because the wind, when the wind is bad, it's 50, 60 miles an hour. And it's, it's a, that's a lot to fight when you're, when you're trying to glass and, and yeah. stay warm and stuff. So anyways, we'll, we'll see if we can find a Saturday that's got some, got some decent weather that we can get out and not, and not push the, uh, the, starving, the starving animals around. Right. So... But a good uh, getting out and shooting, you know, I, I do need to go get, I want to have all my arrows refletched yeah. with different types and uh, different styles of fletchings. Really? And so now that we're using fall away rests, which yes, those of you who bow hunt know the fall away yeah. really is what you need to be doing, but it took us a while to get there. But we had, go ahead. But is it? Well, but I, is it? I sent you a clip this week from Arrow Sniper on TikTok, right? He shoots an arrow up in the air. He rearms his bow, and he shoots that arrow in half as it falls to the earth. You didn't send me that. I sent you, you sent, something. You sent me a, a guy oh. as uh, picking up sheds. Look at that. Just look oh, at that. Oh, that's right. That's what you sent me. <laughs> oh, well, would you look at that? Just look at it. <laughs> everybody's using everybody's using that sound on TikTok right now for that's their all, for shed hunting. That's awesome. Uh, would you look at that? Oh, geez, would you just look at that? Oh, anyway. Look at that. <laughs> So yeah, th there's that one, but there's also Arrow Sniper. I think I, I sent another uh, another TikTok to you uh, of Arrow Sniper where he hit something out of the air. Yeah, I, I don't remember wow. seeing it. So this this week he shot a zombie in the face at 40 yards. No arrow rest, no sight. Okay. Well, so anyways, <laughs> well, pardon me. Let me step back because you know. Hey, um, you got your training wheels for a reason, buddy. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Just, just, yeah. Um, I know. I, I, I know. Someday I'll shoot a recurve like a real man. I, <laughs> but right now I got to use, I got to use the training wheels. I know. I actually want to make my own recurve. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's dreams. my goal. Yeah. Really? Make, make my own recurve. Um, I know somebody who made one. Yeah. Yeah. Tracy. Of course he did. That was in uh, probably 2011 yeah. or well, he made yeah, did he did you shoot it did he no. shoot it yeah he would shoot it yeah but was uh, he any good with it i don't know i'll have oh. to ask him he, i'm sure he still has it i know if i know if i had a recurve and in in, you know something just in the backyard where i could i could just you know i could fling you know 50 60 arrows a day you get those muscles just so worked in we used to go out and shoot at the farm yeah that, that was, was fun sitting in the shade <laughs> yeah i got one of those uh what are they called uh, uh, rock chucks? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You shot a rock chuck with your yeah. bow. Yeah, I shot it in a pa stack of pallets. Yeah, through a stack of pallets. Ha, 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 ha. That was fun. Anyway, <laughs> what are we talking about today? All right. Uh, yeah, so we were supposed to be talking about the loop. Well, the announcements. Right? We didn't go over the announcements. Did you oh, write announcements? I did write announcements. Okay. Check that out. And I thought that's kind of generically where we were kind of So at. it kind of is. I, but the announcements specifically, I want to make sure everybody knows I still want to I still want. I'm still going to make a scouting report. I was looking on Google Earth uh, uh, as where I'm going to make a scouting report. 
somewhere in the Pioneer District. So um, that would be, uh, it's typically where I hunt. It's three different sections here in Idaho. Um, and it's, it covers the Boulder, the White Cloud, and the Pioneer Mountains. It's a huge, huge pretty, swath of Idaho. Pretty large yeah. swath. I mean, and there's there's two two units that are huge and then one that's kind of small, but they together it's just a huge. Yeah, there's tons and tons of territory. So if you're if you're looking to get a tag for Idaho and you, and you we get together for a uh, a scouting report, I will then the Pioneer District is what is what tag you need to ask for. So I know it's getting time to to register for your tags and to put in for your draws and everything. So I want everybody to know, hey, this is what I'm doing. The Pioneer District is pretty good. There's many different districts, right. and the Pioneer District just has the three different sections, but there's plenty of room, and there's plenty of elk. Plenty of place to hunt. Yeah, And that's one thing that I've come to appreciate about just hunting in general, even though we're having more hunters in, enter the sport. Yeah. Um, and I've seen a number of hunters out in the wilderness, but at the same time, it's such a vast spot that, is it, the, the, um, what am I trying to say? The Idaho is so vast in its terrain yeah. that it's, you know, I've, I've talked to hunters and they're like, we're going this way. And I'm like, well, you know, we all got to hunt and there's plenty of room for all of us. So you, you yeah. know, go do that. And I've, I've, if it's, and it brings home the importance of knowing your area. Right. Especially because I ran into some people that just didn't know the area. And so when they told me where they were going, I told them, okay, well, here's what I'm going to do. I know this area. And so, we're we're starting off in a similar direction, but we're we're splitting off. Yeah, and that's that's a large a large part of why you need a scouting report just to understand the area. It's not yeah. about it's not about <clears throat> scouting exactly what animals are there and how many, but it's, it's just the area to know it. Yeah, because uh, and to try to spend as much time as you can in an area, you know. Yeah, out, we either put, during or or outside of a season. And we put in time every summer. We hike up. We put in trail cams. Yeah. But what's funny about the trail cams, they don't start picking up elk activity until August. Yeah, yeah. So those elk are only there in September, August and September. Well, I've seen them there, uh, but they're sparse. They, yeah. they they sort of congregate more, and their activity changes for sure. Yeah, and we yeah we read about that last week. Yeah, as just the hunting pressure changes elk behavior. Oh, really? How about wow. that? <laughs> the wolves. Wolves. Did I say that out loud? It's the wolves. Oh, yeah, it's always just, the wolves. It it's always the wolves. Sorry, I'm not saying that the wolves don't do anything. So those of you who might, who, so that whoever might hear that and get offended, hmm. <laughs> so that is one announcement that uh, I would love to do a scouting report for somebody that's coming out west to hunt. And uh, the other announcement is I'm going to take a rookie hunting this this fall, either second weekend or third weekend in. I'm going to take. I'm going to take a buddy of mine, Houston. I've already talked to him about it. And so we're going to take a weekend. I also, and so I'll, I'll, I'll try to film as much as I can about Houston's adventure, whether he even gets his, his, his archery mm -hmm. <laughs> permit this year. I don't even know, but I've talked to him about it for years. I've backpacked, I backpacked with him before and, and he's, he's excited about it. So we'll see. He's got a baby due this year. He's a, uh, he's, uh, just under 30 years old. So, um, so we'll see, we'll see. Um, but also I have a five-year-old son and I definitely, definitely want to take him elk hunting as soon as I can. And mm -hmm. maybe this year. Okay. We're going to try. Yeah. We're going to try. We're going to try backpacking in the backyard. Okay. And then we might, we might go up to the, uh, the lakes out there outside of Oakley. What's the name of those? Uh, so, independence. Oh, independence. Yeah. The independence lakes. Yeah, I, that's. I, I got a buddy who's been. Uh, how do I say this? Uh, ever since uh, we really met and connected, he's like, "Hey, we got to go hike to Independence Lakes." And so uh, he's going to come to me because my weekends tend to be a lot more flexible than his. Okay. We're actually going to okay. hike up there prior to. He's not an elk hunter or anything like that. He just wanted. That's to okay. Hike it. So I'll, I'll be hiking up there this summer. Yeah. Of course, we've been saying this for like five <laughs> years. But he he, he and I uh, there uh, there's a more of a determination in his voice when he stopped by my office last week. And he's really? like, David, we're just gonna get this on the calendar. We're Let's go. Do it. Let's go. I mean, I'm so, a, I want to stay the night. I want to stay the night. I want to bring my five year old and stay the night. So I think it'll be fun. Uh, I don't I don't even know how long the trail is. I haven't even looked on Google Earth how yeah. long the trail is. But we 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 go. I take him and we hike around Durkees, yeah, which has got some really steep parts to it, both up and down. Um, I guess you know you go you walk in a circle. <laughs> There's going to be equal amounts. Yeah, but um, 
So yeah, I, and I want to I want to bring him elk hunting as soon as I possibly can, just to to have nice. him uh, have him there bugle, you. have him cow talk, and just to Start expose him, him to it. Yeah, just expose him to it soon. So yeah, that's that's on the list for this year. So stay tuned to the the whole elk season brand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we don't have much we don't have much on YouTube yeah. other than yeah. this other than this podcast, but. Which we're, we're building on it. We're yeah, we're, on it. we can't, we have conversations all the time about what to do and how to do it. So it's just uh, as as we get more, yeah, in how it, more evolved. Yeah, yeah. As we grow and learn, and get more people <laughs> that actually are paying attention, <laughs> other than ourselves. I know. I ha- we have <laughs> se- we have seven sisters, and we get we get two views a week on YouTube. Yay! <laughs> had to start sisters. somewhere. <laughs> anyway, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to go with that. You know, you know, like like six of them get together every morning for a conference call. Yeah, you know that, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. This is our conference call. Yeah, that's all we're doing. Just yeah. yeah. If you want to tune in, but you know, if you want to film your conference call with the sisters, please throw that on YouTube. Uh, there you go. <laughs> I'm afraid of what that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. wow. All right, moving on. Yeah, the loop. The loop. Nicholas Evans wrote a book called The Loop. Now, Nicholas Evans is the author of The Horse Whisperer. You don't say. You know, yeah, I know. You know the movie with Robert Redford, and every girl wanted to be a horse girl after that. And Whatever. I'm telling you, on TikTok, all the guys are like, you know what? You ever worried if, if you got a crazy girl? Let me tell you this. If she's a horse girl, she's crazy. <laughs> anyway, I'm married to a horse. I girl. I know. I have a daughter that's a horse girl. I, there's nothing. There's nothing you can do about it. They love horses, and and you throw you throw a uh, tough, rugged, but very gentle with the horses guy into the equation, and it's Robert Redford, you know, and you know, great love story. So, anyways, it did a lot. It did a lot for Montana because Robert Redford. Um, he did a river runs through it, and yep. then he did yeah. uh, the horse whisperer. That's also was the idea. Also took place in Montana. So Nicholas Evans, the author of the horse whisperer, wrote another book. He he wrote he's wrote written more than one book, and I've I've read three of them. One's called the Smoke Jumper, which oh, was yeah we've talked about that. Yeah, it was garbage, and <laughs> I mean <laughs> I didn't like it. Let's put it that way. And the Loop, which I really 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 loved because it delved deep into cattle ranching cattle ranching in montana it's a big deal Mm -hmm. and and the cattle ranching industry had a lot to lose from wolves or so they thought um and so there's this there's this battle of you know this this big expensive rancher i always picture i always pictured white sulfur springs for some reason when i read the book they, they and they, I think they talked a little bit about White Sulphur Springs, but just being on the other side of the Little Belt Mountains, just in no man's land out there. Yeah. And because I, I think I've seen a wolf out there. Okay. I, I don't know if I was with you. I think it was with Slim. Okay. But we saw a big, big dog running like a scared coyote. Wow. So normally dogs are like curious when there's people around. Yeah. Anyway, so so and and this was about the time that wolves are being reintroduced or about to be reintroduced. Not that they needed to be; they were coming back into Montana anyway. And Carter Niemeyer, in his book uh, Wolfer, chronicles that that they were actually they had seen wolves in Montana, northern Montana, coming out of Canada. And uh, but so the loop, the loop, you know, it takes this 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 rancher, this rancher character, and he is everything masculine. Yeah. Right, both yeah, yeah. good and bad. So, right, he's okay. got a, he's got a girlfriend on the side, yeah. and he's got a he's got a son. He's got the firstborn son who's <laughs> okay. also right there with him. Sure. Then he's got the secondborn son, which is kind of a nerd. Tr- and he, yeah. He, yeah. So he 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 dives into books, and he's well read, and he understands ecology, and he understands the wolf okay. problem on on a level that his dad can't. Okay. And, um. So they're. Then there's a wolf biologist who's who's put into this, and she's pretty, and you know she's going to fall in love with some one of these boys. Okay, and <laughs> and then there's an old trapper. There's an old trapper that'll he'll just work. Hey, we're not here. We're not here to to you know to count hides and to to make a mess. We're just here to get rid of wolves. 
And so this rancher hires this old this old wolfer to come in. And the loop is actually is actually a contraption that you put around a den and it's like it's like meat on a bunch of different fish hooks. Okay. And it's looped around the den so that a puppy smells the meat and comes out and gets stuck on it and starts yelping and all the other all the other wolves come out of the den and then while that's happening you shoot the 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 alpha pair. Okay. Anyways, that that's the idea of the of the of the contraption the loop and you can see how these these ideas are at odds with each other and Anyway, so the, the, the son understands a plot of his dad who knows where this... The wolfer disappeared. Okay. He actually died um, because he was an old, he was an old trapper. And, uh, but the dad is like, that's all right. He told me where the den is. We can go there and shoot him ourselves. And so the kid's like, well, I'm going to go there and save the wolves before you have a chance to shoot them. And as his, his dad is siding up to shoot the wolf yeah. or whatever comes out of the den next, it's his own son. And he shoots his son. Oh goodness. Anyway, does it kill him? Relax. I know. That's a heavy that's a heavy hitter, isn't it? Yeah. That's a heavy hitter. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a really good book. And it's all and, and it revolves around the reintroduction. It has a very Lever, liberal leftist slant okay. to it as, okay. as wolves are beautiful and they belong here and, and 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 they certainly are and they certainly do belong here, but they certainly do need to be hunted as well. Yeah. In, in my ex, in my expert opinion. You know, uh, sp- and speaking of that, I I didn't get to listen to it. There was uh, something that was channeling through um, a, the podcast somewhere. I don't know if it was NPR or somewhere. Okay. Talking about some women who were trying to help save yes. cattle from wolves, and that was just last week. So. Yeah, it was. I heard that. I heard that as well. And that was uh, trying trying to help the wolves recover um, with their help as cattle ranchers, as women cattle ranchers. Yeah. 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 Anyway, just- we're, uh, loose thread, but connected. And so, well, you know, you see, you you have Nicholas Evans' book, which takes very the two extreme sides of the story, puts them in the same family. Yeah, <laughs> and said, okay, now there's some contention. Now there's something to write about, and and there certainly was, and and with all the biology and stuff that that goes into that. So it was it was just a really interesting look because I, at the time there's no Google. All, I mean, all I have are reports of of very passionate people saying wolves are going to come into our yards and eat our children. I'm, I'm really hearing that. Yeah, no, (laughs) so far, no wolves have eaten children out of their yards, but I did have someone (laughs) tell me that a wolf chased their family through their house and I just can't. Yeah. I don't see the headline for that. I mean, yeah. Extraordinary claims, yeah, require extraordinary evidence. Yeah, and when we when we talk about when we talk about the wolf subject, I know because I talked to at DK Guidelife at DK Guidelife on on TikTok, and he says, well, you know, these wolves will surround a group of hunters if there's a fresh kill, and I'm like, okay, that's that's great. I believe that that's possible, but I have never seen that. Yeah, and if and if you're going to surround a, a group of hunters anytime in the past ten years. You're gonna have video of it, yeah. So, so you know, some a claim like that, yeah. You're gonna need a lot more, a lot more evidence than than just a claim, right? Right. Um, but and, it, and it's it's not to look. It, it it's not to say that it's not legitimate. It's just that we, yeah, yeah. It 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 very well could be legitimate, but it requires a <laughs> little bit more. That's yeah. all we're saying. Yeah. So so and maybe that is something that's that's going to happen. I know that that uh, wolves will attack men if they're that hungry. Yeah. So okay. Uh, yeah. What, what do they say about a uh, cornered <laughs> animal? Right. Yeah. Right. And I think you know <laughs> what was it? It's so ridiculous. Alex Jones. You know who he is? Uh, yes. <laughs> when it was like early in the pandemic, and he was. Yeah. Do you remember this clip? I don't He's know. like, I am ready to to shoot and gut my neighbors. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> anyway, so you know, he was if he felt cornered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we watched Contagion yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I never watched it before. What's okay? Contagion okay. is a, a Matt uh, Damon movie. Okay. Uh, I can't remember okay. who's, who some of the other actors are, but Matt Damon is one of the big big names, and it's about a pandemic. Okay. 
and it was released in 2011 or 2012. Okay, I think I may have seen it. And it's uncanny. I, I almost wonder if this movie, because of how popular it was when it yeah. came out, because people were like, oh, that's eerie. What if that ever happened? It almost makes me wonder, and I know this is loosely related to Elk Season, but <laughs> it made me wonder uh, if, if enough people had seen this that it primed their mind to behave in the way that the movie, so it became a self-fulfilling prophecy from the way yeah. the store shelves would clean off to the way that, that people would believe in, in unproven methods to treat the disease yeah. to, uh, to how it spreads. To ha- I mean, it's almost uncanny. Yeah, and now it is just a Hollywood movie, but that's I'm not saying that it predicted anything. I'm saying that enough people watched this or communicated about something like this that it built an expectation in the minds. Yeah, and played it played out when it actually happened. Wow. Yeah, that, psychologically, it just makes me wonder. That's all. Yeah, well, maybe maybe there was enough maybe there was enough data on hand to say this is what people would do. Is that art imitating life or life True. imitating art? True. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it just, it's a great point. And that's, yeah. it, I couldn't figure out how to say that. That's exactly <laughs> what I was trying to say. Is it one or the other? And it, who knows? We'll never know. So it's not that I want to speculate, but it makes me yeah. wonder just because we are habit forming creatures and we will, we will form habits based on just visually seeing how others might form a habit. And we can do that by literally seeing each other do it by uh, right. being in person or just watching a video. Right. So. Now, now there's another there's another book I read <laughs> called The Hot Zone. Okay, um, and it doesn't take place out west, but the uh, they made a movie out of it called Outbreak. Yeah, with Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. So I thought out- about that while I was watching Contagion. Outbreak was not based on The Hot Zone. Okay. Oh, not. Did you just set me up for that? Not technically, not <laughs> legally. Okay. But I watched Outbreak, and I'm like, that's interesting. Hollywood is really great. At, they want their weapon. and But then I read The Hot Zone, and I'm like, so the Mataba River virus is in Outbreak, and The Hot Zone was about Ebola. In, in Outbreak, the, it, the 100%, 100% mortality in humans, 0% in the host animal, in, in the monkeys. Okay. But in the book, it was 100% mortality rate of the monkeys and zero percent and it was ebola wow and it was in virginia at a lab miles away from our state capital wow i mean it was close and had anybody some people actually got in and got the contagion were found to have ebola and have no side effects i don't know if they're immunized from ebola now but ebola ebola is a, a very very scary virus and reading that book and understanding if Ebola could 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 mutate fast enough, could get into populations like COVID did, and yeah. mutate and mutate into different strands, it could be it could be. They talk about different strands yeah. and contagion. And here's oh, okay. so this is what's interesting too. The virus in contagion came from a bat from a live food market. <laughs> Easy I'm not pickings. I'm not yeah. trying I'm not trying to start wow. conspiracy. I'm just saying, isn't it interesting? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. Oh, Lawrence Fishburne's in it. Bats That's make name. sense. They can travel yeah. long distances and yeah. transmit viruses over areas. You know, that's where that's where AIDS AIDS came from. Came from Mount Elgon in Africa. Yeah. And I was that the hot zone? I don't remember. Uh but the the whole idea was as soon as as soon as roads were built, yeah. now the virus has time to move. Mm-hmm. So bats, they can they can fly and they're mammals, so their physiology is close to ours, so yeah. uh, you know it. It just makes it just that just makes sense. Yeah, to use a live food market and bats. Yeah. So just mm. just, just curious minds. That's all. <laughs> just you know, I am not uh, a conspiracy theorist uh, kind of person, but it makes it. Just, I just like to wonder out loud because there I'm are not, some there are some amazing coincidences. Yeah, and but, and that's really what I chalk it up to at the end of the day. It's really coincidental, but at the same time, I'm not going to say, "Oh, it's too coincidental." Yeah, when so you when you do have when you do have coincidences like that, and I, I you know you you can see videos online of people just going, "Well, let's let's take a look at all these coincidences. Look at all the coincidences uh, the Simpsons have have made." <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. But if you take all of the predictions that they make and you average out the ones they got right. It equals, yeah, they got lucky. Yeah, exactly. Like, really, they just there's, got lucky a few there, times. There's a statistical analysis you can yeah. do on that. It's called a non-parametric test, 
and you can okay. you can test for numbers that uh, does this actually represent uh, right. All, all things being equal, is this actually representative? And so it's a really interesting test. We don't have to go to stats, though. It's okay. I yeah, not, not stats class today. Yeah. Uh, anyway, next yes. on the list is Trail Tales. <laughs> trail Tales. You got. You have some good Trail Tales for us today. Well, I don't know if they're good. They're they're interesting. Um, since we've done the podcast, I've had an uptick in the number of dreams that I have about okay. hunting. And, and not sp- just hunting. I'm hunting, but I'm hunting with you. Okay. And so I've had two dreams to date this year that really stuck out to me. And, and the first um, the first one, um, you harvested a bull. Far out. Yeah. Sweet. Finally. And, <laughs> right. And that's, <laughs> I, I don't really remember a lot of the details from the dream other than I just remember showing up and you had started the process of, of uh, field dressing it and things okay. like that. So I... Uh, but I was like, hey, I, I don't know why. I don't know why you had to have the, the kill, but yeah. I, I'm not jealous. <laughs> Apparently, uh, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> no, I, uh, I don't get me going on, on wish fulfillment and dream interpretation, blah, blah, <laughs> blah. Uh, anyway, but uh, congrats in my dream for that. Thank you. But yeah. I, I had an, another dream that was kind of interesting. It was just a couple of days ago. Uh, elk hunting with you. And what's funny is I had just watched the uh, one of the recent Elk 101 videos the previous okay. day. So uh, dreams most commonly, according to the research, are replaying previous day's events. Right. And so there's a, a scene in, this isn't really a spoiler alert, but there's a scene in, in one of the last Elk season videos, uh, Elk 101, Rather, Destination Elk. Yeah, is it? Oh, it's the Desti- hunting. The hunting episodes are Destination Elk. Oh, I thought it was Elk One Hundred One. Yeah, Elk Elk One Hundred One is one of the groups in oh, Destination Elk, yeah. but the video series is yeah, I think yeah. it's Destination Elk. Either anyway. way, either way. So they're they're show they're hunting and they're looking across this hillside, and it's like all of a sudden the cameraman turns and Elk came almost up the hill at them. Do you remember uh-huh. that scene? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so okay. something like that played out in my dream where you and I were, were looking across at some elk and some elk came up, but there was a house nearby and we were near fences. And then there was a road where we were camped and we were trying to go hunting. But as we went, as we were, there was nobody out there. And then when we hiked back to our tent, like a bunch of, I, you were, were kind of like drifters, like people just all of a sudden <laughs> sporadically set up all these camps everywhere. And, and I'm like, this is going to kill our chances tomorrow. Yeah. And so the pe- hill people moved. In. Yeah, it was weird. And then that's, that's yeah. the, mem- that's the dream. So okay. it's a weird trail tale, but it was, okay. I, I, it's, it's interesting to me that the increase of frequency, um, from, from previous days events. I know previous days events play out in your dreams, but I don't recall ever having dreams of hunting where I remember them like I have. So, I don't know what that means, but I just thought I should talk about it because it's kind of interesting. But and it has to do with elk. And if now there's a, a so there's there's what science says versus what people believe. Okay, <laughs> right. And when it comes to dreams, it's no different. Right. And so what the science says, most likely previous days events. There's no prediction there, but people believe dreams mean more than they really mean. Right. And so could this mean that you get a bull this year? Okay. And. Do I have unconscious concern about overcrowding of other hunters or other people? Mm. So anyway, just weird stuff. Okay, so there it's you go. all there. It's, it's all it's up on there. record now. Okay, yeah, and it and it's on record. So when I shoot a bull, I will year, say I dreamed this. You owe me. And let me tell you something. I am a hundred percent confident I'm going to shoot a bull this year. Yeah. Just as as I've been every year. That I haven't. <laughs> and it, it's an interesting thing. I, I stalled in my answer, uh, and you cut me off anyway because you wanted to answer. Uh, well, but it, it is. A, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I know that was No, wasn't I a, wasn't sure how to say confident. I know. Lack of confidence there, Dave. 100%. Uh, but, every time. <laughs> but it is. It is like this. I, I You get out, and it's like, this is the day. It doesn't matter how much lack of success you had the yeah. previous day. It's just like, here we go. Yeah. It, it, particularly when... Especially now that we know how to to break down a mountain and and go and and traverse those hillsides to be able to find the elk in the first place because that's a big part of it. Yeah, knowing where to find the elk and that was in the first decade of the new millennia. That's where we just didn't know, and then we started to get better data and started to follow better yeah. leads. And now we just have you know two decades of experience that helps us go okay. <laughs> but in two decades, still haven't been successful. I'm still part of that ninety percent. Well. Has it been two decades, though? I mean, really? 
10, 15 years. Let's not, let, you know, let's call it a week. <laughs> Good point. We haven't been doing it that long. Anyway, do you have any trail tales? Uh, I have I have so many. <laughs> I have so many. Uh, I, the first shot I ever took at a bull elk, you can see from interstate, what, which one is that? Oh, I forget. It, I-15, Interstate 15. Okay. As you drive outside of Boulder, there's a, there's a section out Boulder, of, Montana. Out, between a Boulder, Montana and Helena, Montana. It's about 30 miles. And between those two is a big pass. And on the, let's see if I'm going north, the east side is the Elkhorn Mountains. And in the Elkhorn Mountains, you can only, I know Elkhorn, you can only shoot spike bull. Yeah. Unless you draw a permit. So there are big bulls everywhere. It was fun just to drive into the Elkhorns in my little geo tracker, just find some little road and just muscle up, just stop, get out and bugle and listen to four or five answers in four or five different directions. I mean, they were everywhere. There was a ton of elk, but you could only shoot a spike. And I'm on I'm on the frontage road. It used to be the highway before the Interstate 15 okay. rolled up, and so we're on this we're on this old highway, and we're we're coming up, and we jump two or three elk, and one of them's a spike, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I can shoot that spike. So as as the road had a had a very had a, had a cutout on it, and it's a very steep cutout. So you you the hill's not that steep, but you run up this really steep part of the hill and then you're looking at the rest of the hill so the yeah. hills has this angle but the the cutout yeah, has, yeah. has has a much steeper angle so i have to climb up and i only you know i don't even have a quiver not attached to my bow yeah i have a bow and i have one arrow <laughs> <laughs> and weird. and i and i and i get out of the because we just jumped them driving up it's just barely light enough mm-hmm. i mean it's this illegal <laughs> right and so but I cl- I run up to the side. I run up the side of this really steep embankment. I look over the top, and there's this spike bull broadside, 25, 30 yards. And I knock an arrow, and I pull it all the way back. And I I just wanted to take a moment, you know, to say, "Hasta la vista, baby." <laughs> to, to no, I didn't. I didn't. But to to just to just feel that moment, to yeah. know this is the take- moment between life and death for us. Yeah. Right. And then I let the arrow go. And I saw a spark. And it, the light was low enough. I didn't see a barbed wire fence oh. hanging down in front of me, looping all the way down. And so he wandered off. He didn't even get spooked. Wow. That arrow, that is something oh. I think something on my broadhead hit that arrow and it flinged off somewhere or it sank into the dirt. <sighs> That's that was heartbreaking. A, oh and, my god. And having one arrow. Oh and, my and we used to hunt with only four arrows between the two of us thinking and, that we had every, I mean, we did have everything we need cause you only need one shot, but yeah. <laughs> and I can see that spot. I can see the, there's like, there's like on the, on, you, as you drive up outside of Boulder, I can see that from I 15. I am reminded wow. of that shot every time I drive that section of interstate. Cause I can look over there and go, yep, yeah, that's where I miss that, that spike bull. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's heartbreaking, man. It's heartbreaking. <laughs> oh. So many, many trails. That many trails, tales from the trail. Trail tales. <laughs> so that's one of them. That was a bummer. So uh, destination elk. Destination elk. Yeah. What did you did you uh, you did you see both of them? Both episodes. Mm-hmm. What did you think? One was shorter. I'm trying to remember. The which... first one was 16 minutes, I think, and the second one was 46. I'm guessing. Yeah. But right in that ballpark. Whatever, whatever's going on for these guys, it's been really hard. Yeah. Because seven tags remaining has been the theme for what two, three weeks of video. Now. <laughs> yeah, there was eight, and that yeah, eight. Yeah, there we got one tag in the past three weeks, I think, and maybe two eight, episodes a week. Of course, but they're only doing eight days. So anyway, the math uh, is maybe a little hard to follow here, but the, ultimately, and we've talked about this before, where you can appreciate the patience you have to have, the time that you have yeah. to put in. And just and and how that number of ten percent success rate works because even though they've gotten half their tags, I mean, in the big picture of things, that's a that's a minority of people, right? And the small group, it, uh, it, you're seeing where that rest of the difficulty comes from. Is it 
Yeah. You know, uh, was, that was that was the 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 emotion that I identified most with uh, this week on Destination Elk was the emotion of struggle. Yeah. And and the heat that was 2021. Yeah, it was a warm. It year. was hot and smoky and dry and yeah. And so those guys are struggling. And I, I appreciate that they take the time to not show us a harvest, to yeah. just show us the struggle. Because I love that, too. Because it's part of the journey, man. Yeah. And you never know what, what kind of uh, weird side. Uh, oh, I don't know what I'm trying to say here other than it's uh, you just never know what's going to happen. Right. In the, in the downtime, like, for instance, uh, we had a long, arduous, hot hike. You got dehydrated that yeah. day, but we, <laughs> but but on the way to your dehydration, yeah. we <laughs> we didn't help matters much when we used that uh, that stupid thing from Walmart. Oh, at the pizza that was oh. horrible. The food, <laughs> the food. You've got to do better on the food, man. Oh man. I, I told. I know. I talked a lot last week about Mark Kenyon and <coughs> that wild country. Yeah. And but Mark Kenyon, every time, every time he's out backpacking and he talks about food, he says reconstituted. He says dehydrated. He says pouch. He's I mean, it's it's he even used Mountain House once. Yeah, it's the same thing. Stop doing that to yourself. Stop. Of course, they, oh. they, you've probably got a really good argument. We're just not going to listen to much of it. <laughs> and to, to each their own. So if you like the dry stuff, great. But uh, I'll I tell you what. I, you know what? I have been out with guys. And I think, and I, I, I know I've told the story before, but I look with envy at their food pouches. Mm -hmm. And then I, I, I could finally afford enough so I could just buy my own food pouches. And I realized how awful that is. I had been eating so much better with my quesadillas and potatoes and oatmeal. And, and to watch those guys watch me eat. Now I see envy in their eyes. Yeah. When they have a pouch and I'm crunching on a quesadilla, oh, baby, I can smell the envy. So, <laughs> did I read this on I, our I, podcast yet? I don't know. So I just It's just a snippet. So just a quick synopsis. Uh, if you're listening... Um, uh, versus seeing, I have a, a, a manuscript here, a transcript, man, I, something. I I went on a hike in the Bob Marshall yeah, in nineteen. Let's call it a manifesto. I mean, yes, my Bob Marshall <laughs> manifesto here. I was gone for four or five days hiking uh, for a summer course that I just took right before I moved to, to Idaho, and I was thirteen when I did this hike. And as I was reading through this, it's got horrible, uh, horrible grammar, horrible spelling, but. Uh, part of it makes me realize how, just how long I've not liked reconstituted food. Yeah, Recon yeah. Reconstituted food. Reconstituted, yeah. And so here's here's the uh, the end of day one. Uh, I have the very last paragraph. It says the night that night I had a preferred can of raviolis, one yeah. of the foods you have to have on any kind of camping trip. I was convinced that raviolis were a must when you go camping. Oh, and they canned are ones, good. Can, the can, I'm, look. That's not much better than reconstituted. It's in a can, but yeah. I didn't. But it was better than reconstituted, if you know what Ugh. I mean. And so, uh, besides yeah. that, and here's here's the catcher though, and here it's the next line. Besides that, I wasn't about to pack the dry stuff. <laughs> that right there is just at the bottom. Of don't want to pack the dry stuff. Don't want to pack the dry stuff. I don't. <laughs> I don't know why I had such a thing about it then, and I've tried it since then, but yeah. it just. I've still got Mountain House crap you've left in my gear. I don't know why I don't just throw it out. I know. I know. I guess I'm looking for that unsuspecting soul I, like a pond of doctor. It, Wait, who's that guy you're taking out? Dehydrated food. <laughs> His name's Houston. There you go. Rookie. Dehydrated food <laughs> is for the apocalypse, not for an adventure. And I know a lot of guys would be like, oh, the apocalypse is it would be an adventure. <laughs> yeah, well, hold on to your mountain house. <laughs> the year is young. But you really, I mean, that stuff, that stuff, uh, when when nothing else is available. But it's it's so not hard to bring a little bit of canola butter and a little bit of cheese and to have some 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 good meat. And I know I say spam a lot, but but summer sausage and pepperoni and, and beef jerky. Well yeah. That's that's a given for many of the guys. I'll 
Minnesota. And, but and and little pouches of chicken and stuff that we find. Yeah. Really good stuff. I, I was uh, looking for other options back in the day and came across the bagged chicken. And since that time, because it was actually a big pouch of chicken, and yeah. since then they have single servings of chicken, which is really cool, and it's easy to pack, light enough. Plus, I found stuff... Uh, if you go, I think the, the trick with finding good options for hiking and, and eating is you have to go through the store with an open mind of, of and, and you know how you backpack, you right. know what you pack and just kind of watch for those items that stick out. Cause you have to go in with that frame of reference right. in your mind. I'm here looking for backpacking stuff. So go down, uh, any aisle, every aisle, really. Can I mash it? Yeah. Can it be, can it be stuffed in a pack and mashed and bumped? And so th- that's a question you ask. Yeah. Does it need to be refrigerated? Does right. it need to be sealed back up once it's open? Because in the Mexican food aisle, I found the Chilirio brand of yeah. pulled pork. Oh, and man. And that stuff. Whew. Yeah. That made some That made some good, case some good lunch. Yeah. I think we just, that was were pretty sloppy. We just tacoed oh, them up. Maybe, yeah. That was As, it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, and I think that was... I, I, it seems like it was that same year we we called in that raghorn and the spike with the cow that I fell asleep on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think so. That was right yeah. before that. Yeah. So always, always a trail from the tail, a tail yeah. from the trail. <laughs> food, food tails. All right, conservation. Yeah. So I'm just going into uh, the well. We we have it historically called the tangents folder. But uh, you said uh, before we started, maybe that should be sort of a general announcement kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, I, I brought it up, I think, once or twice before on the podcast. It's just the snowpack level. Is that what you're talking about? Um, no, I just oh, okay. the different stories that we would put in our tangents folder. I didn't know if you meant oh. we should change that from tangents to announcements. But Oh, yeah, I, it doesn't matter. Tangents is so, fine. Conservation tangents. Yeah. Uh, this one caught my eye. So when I was sort of uh, organizing this earlier, Massachusetts shed hunter discovers buck that was half eaten by coyotes, but yeah. still alive. Yeah. Half eaten, half eaten by coyotes, but still alive. The only reason, the only reason I wanted to talk about that story uh, was because I, I have followed Temple Grandin. I don't know if you, yeah, you know, who yeah. Temple Grandin is, it's a great movie on HBO called Temple Grandin. I have a daughter with autism. So Temple Grandin is, what they label as the most accomplished person in the world with autism. And she's a large animal scientist. Yeah. She really understands um, big animals. And she says, listen, nature is cruel. You know, if these, if these cows, she, she designs slaughterhouses. She loves yeah. cows, but right. she designs slaughterhouses. And she says, listen, nature is cruel. When you die in nature, it's awful. And yeah. we don't have to be. We know, we know. Hey, we we thank these animals for giving their life for our quarter pound cheeseburgers. Yeah. And we thank these animals that we hunt for giving their life so we can have stories to tell when our kids are eating our our jerky and our sausages yeah. and our elk steaks. Yeah. And and so nature is cruel, but we don't have to be. So that's kind of that's kind of a temple grand saying. We don't have to be cruel. And there's no need. And there are there are thousands of examples everywhere you look. Oh, a hunter rescues a fawn. Yeah. From from the ice. This guy does this, you know. Well, it you know, it's a week from hunting season and these two bucks got locked together and armies of men, of hunters will show up to save those deer's lives yeah, exactly. as much as they'll show up a week later when hunting season opens. So, you know what? We don't we don't like to see Oh, I'm so sorry. We don't like to see cruelty, but um but and, but this 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 idea it, of, of humane killing, it, and I I wonder if it if if your thought process is related to how some people would look at hunters as being cruel to nature, and what it yeah. sounds like you're saying is like yeah. we're we're not if we're you're, definitely if, not if you're being ethical and you're being um, yeah considerate you're 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 doing everything you can to be the most ethical person and it's not like you're going out and you're you're chasing this animal stressing it out and then coming back and throwing another arrow in it where it's not going to kill it you know it right that's not what it's like and at all more than 90 percent of hunters are going to come home empty-handed are that are <laughs> oh you were going there oh i didn't know I think you, sorry 90 percent of hunters are are <laughs> that minded right they they don't want to they 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 don't want to be cruel they're there they're there to harvest an animal. They want to do it quickly. Yeah. And they're they're there to save a fawn or rescue bucks that are tangled together. Yeah. So and that's got it's at least 
of of sportsmen at yeah. least. It's weird though. Yeah, I'm conflicted about helping uh, bucks that have their horns entangled. I'm conflicted about helping an animal out of the ice. I get that the numbers could go down, but at the same time, that's what nature does. Natural so for me, selection. it's like I I I just don't know that I would step in so quick to help a, a fawn. Yeah. You know, in those situations, because it's not, well, you're right. You're right. You know, if, for instance, if an elk get, falls in my window well, that I need to help that elk out of the window well. For, that your, was, for your window's sake, not for the elks. Well, that was a man made situation. Yeah. Okay. At, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha, you. Gotcha. Versus this happened to them naturally. You're right. So I think unnatural situations, we probably should be watching out for that. But like, get rid of that dumb you plant that you have in your gardens up north in. Uh, Blaine County, right? Because that's an intrusive species, and it kills the animals. Yeah, that's that's a very fixable problem. Yeah, right. right. So, in that case, I would say make make the move. <laughs> so anyway, anyway, but that's again to each their own. That's just where I'm at. So, you, but you're but you're right. There is there is a level of human interference that changes the behavior of the animal. Right. Right. You 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 have a, a, a stretch of highway where, you know, you can slow down and, and stick lettuce out your window and feed deer. Yeah. They go to another highway and slow down and stand in the middle of the road at night yeah. when the speed limit is 50 miles an hour there. You're causing a problem. You're not yeah. feeding deer. I do like this uh, this idea. And they're they're popping up more and more. And I kind of would hope to see more of them. And that's those those um, wildlife bridges. Yes. Yes. I remember the first one I saw was under construction on my way towards Wells, Nevada. Yeah, yeah. And it just was really cool to see that. Yeah, there's two of them now on the way to Wells. Yeah. Yeah. And understanding uh, that that more often than not now the animals are using that because it's yeah. an, it's an impeded barrier. Yep. It's in more, yeah, anyway, just and happy for those it things. it saves money. Yes. It saves money. And lives, really. Well, yes, because every time, every time... Officers need to be called out to that stretch of highway because a car is wrecked. You're, that's that's Nevada, folks. That is sparse. Yeah, it's going to take some time to get there. It's if you have a serious huge injury, drain on resources. It's it's bad. How many how many deputies per square mile do they have? Right. <laughs> it's not very many. So, anyways, it, it's it saves money by having that having that infrastructure there, and saves a lot of uh, w- wild game too. This post that you you po- you put in there, yeah, I was really curious about it because it's kind of cryptic, okay. Um, and so I'm really curious to see All right, where let's... it's at. So if science can't measure something or we humans can't perceive it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Uh, truth, illusion, and the reality. There's so much more. Tell me more about this. It's a really cool picture. A place I swear I've been before. Here, let me see. Oh, yep. <laughs> Don't drop the iPad. Let's see. Huh? Is that ringing a bell? Maybe it's not. Oh goodness! It's not. It's from Mountain Journal. Mountain Journal is uh, it it actually is suggested for me. Oh, because I I I I follow a lot of stuff on Facebook. I don't know if I I maybe it, I didn't follow that. Wow. Oh, well, darn or it. I just don't remember. It seemed really interesting. I come across a lot of stuff, and I sometimes I'm busy, and so I snap a picture of it and I throw it in my pictures file, and I go, "We'll talk about this this weekend." On the Elk Season podcast for sure. And uh, I don't know. I'd have to get my phone, which is recording me, <laughs> and look it up. So this next one, uh, when I, as soon as I saw it, I go, okay. This is this is how late to the game we tend to be. Like okay. we're, we're first gens. We're, we're trying to figure out this hunting thing. And now that we're doing this podcast, there's all these different events that we could attend. And this one, we're missing yeah. right now. And you it, know what know, I'm talking about. I do. Yeah, it's up in Boise this weekend. Yeah. What's it uh, called? It's the oh, it's Sp- Idaho Spokane. Sportsman Show. Is that Spokane? No, this is okay. Boise, Idaho. Okay. Um, uh, till 4 o'clock today. We could maybe get up there to see yeah. everybody putting their booths away. I know. Uh, but the Idaho Sportsman Show, March 3 through 6. So, ah. <sighs> We need to make Next plans time. to be there. Next time. Because we talked yeah. about going to the one in Salt Lake. Yes, we're like, we definitely. should go there. And we not even thinking about it. Because it's funny. We live in a state and we see all these things going elsewhere. And we're, we don't even think to go, well, does Idaho have that? Yeah. And so the lesson is. <laughs> they do. Does they Idaho probably have do. That? Yeah. And so we just need to keep yeah, that in mind. You know, Boise, Boise is a very big, big place. Yes. I, and and it, it has grown incredibly fast over the past 15, 20 years. 
And there's a lot of guys that are that need jobs that like to bow hunt that got to live in Boise because that's where the jobs are. So I know they've got a they've got a great economy for it, and to go to one of those shows um, uh, would be would be smart smart for us. So I'd like to yeah. meet some of the some of the people that uh, just get just get a selfie with some of the famous people on YouTube. <laughs> well, it'll be it'll be nice though. And, and here's a, here's a weird way to look at it. Here's one way to look at it. Okay. Many ways to look at everything, of course. Uh, but when we make the plans for next year, it'll be the difference between saying, "Hey, we just started a podcast. We're on ten versus <laughs> we started a podcast and we're on episode sixty, right? Versus fifty two or versus two, right? So there's that. So okay. it, I think the number carries a little bit more weight. I, again, I don't know though because I have never done this kind of thing before. Me either. It's 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 been going fun. I've been having fun. It's it's been great. Yeah. I, I think the if anything, being able to hang out with <laughs> with right. my hunting my hunting pal. Right. So because uh, it's hard to find time, and so just making time. It's like right. I know I've got you this weekend, <laughs> so I, I, you didn't have to text today because I was like. I was already in here going through files and getting stuff ready to go. 10 good, minutes till, good, so good. It's a habit by this point. Good, good. I like I like it. It's a good habit. We need to form some other habits because we need to get out shed hunting. And then, we, you know, if we're there and driving for hours on end, it's a perfect time to try to put together a podcast. Yeah. But anyway, logistics gotta, of all that. I think that the whole thing is, is practice. Well, it's practice, but you have to do something for the first time to know how it's going to evolve. And so, a lot of our, right. a lot of hesitation for individuals tends to be related to that unknown of if I if I do this, how is this going to turn out? So we tend to either be reserved or we just don't do it. Oh yeah. And okay. so when you take that first step, you start to to fight through that curve. So right. it's a matter of we know what we want to do, and we just have to put our feet in it and see how it goes because. We ultimately did that with this podcast this year, and we started off and going, we're not sure how it's, how it's going to go. We just we just started it, and I think that's what you have to just trust the process. And if it's going to continue, it's going to work out. Yeah. And if it's not, it's not. You know, so it's just a matter of. I'm passionate what enough about elk season, and have been passionate enough about elk season for many many years, for as long as I can remember. And and when I come across guys, and you want to talk about anything. If there's anything, do you hunt elk? Do you archery hunt? Do you, that's what I want to talk about. Do you do you fish steelhead? Do yeah. you go after grouse? Do you like rabbits? I mean, what do you do a field in the in the outdoor outdoor sports arena? Yeah. So that's that's what I prefer to talk about. I love those stories. Yeah. Growing up in Montana, man, you heard you heard some old boys tell some stories. Yes. So yeah, it's. That's what I love. That's that's what I'm passionate about. I'm going to give you a number off of this headline. Okay, uh, four hundred and forty million dollars. Yeah, yeah. Is that is that a year uh, per year? Conservation efforts through donations uh, uh, to groups like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Right, right. This is beside the fifteen billion dollars we talked about last week. Yeah, that hunters give the states for conservation. This is additional stuff. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation does a ton of benefits and fundraisers. And there's a lot, there's a lot of fundraisers every year um, in every community mm -hmm. um, that help benefit that help benefit conservation. And this number is ha almost half a billion. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. And speaking of those kinds of events, that's probably, I don't know, you can expand on this, but the Spokane County Fairgrounds Bighorn Show is likely a conservation effort of sorts. So that that headline was there because it's funny. Um, what did I miss? <laughs> that's a mountain goat. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's not no. a bighorn sheep. Oh, why my the, gosh. Why has the bighorn show got a, got a mountain sheep? I flipped over to that as <laughs> you were talking, goat. and I noted that in my brain. I go, they've got a goat for a bighorn thing, and it didn't even register. <laughs> and, I, and, and I went hunting in the Elkhorn Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to actual... Flathead Lake effort to protect Rocky Mountain Bighorn with an actual image of, of a, Bighorn of an actual Bighorn. So yeah. I actually I looked that up because I love uh, uh, I love the Kalispell area. Um, I don't know how many times have you ever driven from Missoula into Kalispell? Not that I can remember. Oh, oh my! Gosh. I I remember driving with uh, mom and dad to come see you in Post Falls. Yeah, that and, doesn't cover that route. Yeah, so I that's the yeah. only time I can remember being up there. Uh, I do remember the first time I saw a, a bighorn sheep, and it wasn't even in the wild. It was 
where our sister Jane lived outside of Missoula. Oh, yeah. And yeah. They, would, they would come down and feed in the area, in the little well, trailer park she lived. That's in the wild. Yeah. Uh, and I got a really cool picture of a ram with a broken horn. Oh, yeah? But, uh, yeah, I've got a... It was 2004. Wow. Um, got a picture of a ram. I know. Year. She used to post pictures all the time of so, the big horns that came down into her yard. Yeah. And yeah. That, that was really something else to see um, those animals like that. So... Uh, but yeah, uh, you were saying the Flathead Lake. So Flathead Lake, there's a what's the name of that? It's a Hungry Horse, Hungry Horse Island, and it's a big. There's a really, really big island at Flathead Lake, and I think it's called Hungry Horse Island. And so here's my question: they have they have too many uh, too many mountain lions, and not enough bighorn. And so they culled the mountain lion. Oh look at that! You have to send that to me. Let me yeah. see that again. Where's the where's the broken horn? Uh, it's actually on the other side. Oh, um, you can't quite tell. So I just have to take your word for it. Listen, extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence. Okay, <laughs> that's that's nice. Uh, <laughs> that, that came out a little too a little too good. A little too passive aggressive. <laughs> anyway. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's <all right. laughs> you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be used to me poking at you like that. Uh, uh, anyway, nice. so, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. You know about the the famous ecological study of Isle Royale. Isle Royale had moose, and Isle okay. Royale had wolves. Okay. The wolves eat the moose. The moose die. The wolves don't have anything to eat. The wolves die. The moose reproduce. Right. Right. And there's this famous uh, ecological study of, well, this is what happens. So now we have mountain lions on an island, indigenous mountain lions on an island. They can get there. Oh, they, that's right. That's they right. can get to the island when the, when, they, when the lake ice is over. Right. And now we have bighorn sheep on that island. Yep. And so why are they culling the mountain lions? Because they want to... That, yeah, that's that's just what I'm asking, and, and yeah. I I disagree with it. Okay. Well, what if the mountain lions eat all the all the sheep? Well, then that's evolution, man. The sheep don't get to live. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If it, yeah. If, if they got there naturally, but if 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 the, if really if truly the strongest and the fastest of them don't get eaten, mountain lions die. Right. If if they're I, so if they're so sparse, they can't reproduce. And and here's my thing. I think the the mountain um, mountain the bighorn sheep, yeah, they really just need to start using their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> that's true. That's true. I would like to see a full on run at a, at a mountain lion. At a mountain lion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right so, uh, the next, anyways the, anyways <laughs> but you see my point yeah it's like well absolutely. why are why are you interfering with nature that's that is that's natural that's supposed to be happening yeah. um uh, but then again i argue for the reduction of of predators because of the increase of human predators right so my my so to come full circle is yeah. to go well that goes back to the conversation we've had before related to active management, which I'm, I'm, I, because of man's influence on wildlife, we have to be thoughtful and considerate of that management process. Yes. So when it comes to certain things, should we ignore them because it's nature? Like they have interlocked horns. This happens versus because of man's pressure, did these, did, did an unseasonably amount, uh, unseasonably, did it, uh, a larger amount of mountain lions make their way to the lake because there's a lack of resources elsewhere because of man's intrusion. Okay. Okay. Right. You're, you're right. There, there's, there's probably something out there that would give us an indication of that. Yeah. And maybe they're using that data, and I don't know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know either. Um, and the same thing with the bighorn. But are the bighorn protected? Are there any human predators on that island? I don't know. And you, yeah. And if not, then... Why would yeah? Then it would be even tougher to make the argument for culling the mountain lions, right? To me, but I don't know. Maybe that's part of a hunting section in Montana. Maybe you can pull a permit for for that yeah. island and go hunt bighorn there. At, at the very least, share your thoughts when they have open forums because 
Montana Fish, yeah. Wildlife, and Parks is probably like Idaho Fish and Game, where they say, hey, come have a conversation with us about this. So make sure your voice is at least heard if you have those yeah. opportunities. I, I, I never feel like my voice is heard. If I, you go to those meetings, you ever been to one? You ever, I, I, took my, <laughs> I, I made the mistake of taking my son as a, for his civics merit badge for Boy oh, Scouts. Good. We went and saw Larry Craig speak. Oh, good. At CSI. And we got to ask, we got to ask him questions. Wow. Yeah. I asked Mike Simpson a question one time. Yeah. Had nothing to do with this though. Yeah, sa- yeah, same here, but the thing is, I'm just such an emotional guy. I I get so invested in whatever's happening around me. Yeah. You, you want to talk about school politics? Oh, I'm in 100%. Yeah, well, <laughs> you, you have you certainly have the the stuff at the state level and the national level, but you also have the the entities that are trying to manage all of this stuff. And that would be fish, wildlife and parks, uh, Idaho fishing game. Right. And, and those are the forums that I'm speaking to, not necessarily your local uh, Senator or representative. I'm talking like the people who are actually doing that process that are collecting the data that are trying to report back to the public and trying to gather that. Because like I said, I, I did a survey, Right. Yeah. I used the opportunity. Right. They sent me that survey. So I went ahead and I, I took the time to fill it out because if I'm going to be an active participant in what they have to offer, I need to be an active voice. And so um, I just need to, to if that is sort of a personal right. challenge on me to, to either to, to do more of those surveys. And also, if I can think of it, if I can make sure I have the time to go out to those events when they have an invitation for like, hey, come talk to us about this aspect of what's going on with this region and this yeah. management and all of that. So I think my 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 fear and anxiety is based on uh, my need to be too involved once I'm involved. <laughs> like, so you asked me for my comments. <clears throat> I said my comments. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to follow up? Why didn't you call me? <laughs> yeah. <Anyway>. So, <laughs> well, there's that. So you know, you know, I get I get a little too excited. All right, the next two headlines are related, okay, uh, to drought. So we have a 22, 22 year mega drought deepened so much last year that the uh, the broader region is now the driest spell in twelve hundred years, according yeah. to KTVB.com. Yeah, it was a it was a very very hot dry year. Yeah. I mean, we we hunted in our lo- uh, in the area we tend to go. Yeah, and I've commented to many people like I've, I've I saw creeks that were dry that I had just never seen dry before. Yep. And it was interesting though because we went up there and there had been a snowstorm a couple of days prior, and some of those had come back to life because of the the runoff. Yes, which I thought yes. was wasn't well, that interesting. Yeah, because uh, there's that one stretch on that trail that just was like completely dry, and then we came back through that one time. And it was just <laughs> there was a little trickle come through, but I just yeah. never seen it dry before. Yeah, and we've seen it snow a foot and a half, and that ground soaks that water up so fast. Yeah, like by mid afternoon, you can grab a handful of dry dirt. Yeah, where a foot and a half of snow melted into. Yep. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. And then then you posted the map of the the drought conditions, and I'm I'm happy to see that the places we like to go are are a little bit greener in yeah. terms of the green yeah. less or a little bit more water, but it, we're still. Uh, according to their metric here, it's it's under 100% yeah. and uh, still need we, water. We did get a lot of snow. We got snow in the past couple of days. Yep. We got snow here in southern Idaho. Um, but, yeah, there was the snowpack levels throughout the state are important. I didn't see any of them over 100%. No, I didn't either. Which, which is concerning um, because we got a bunch of really good snow in December, and we thought, okay, we just need one or one or two good storms in January and February, man, and we'll be set. And those storms never came. Yeah. So we got some just recently. Hopefully we'll get some some good rain and maybe some more snow for the mountains. Yeah. But um application stuff. Uh I did not realize this. Um going to the Sun Road in Glacier National Park, you have to apply for a permit. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. So I, I saw a report this week, too, that 4 million people, I among them, visited Zions National Park this last fall. Wow. This last summer. Yeah. I knew we, we waited in line for two and a half hours. Wow. To hike up Angel's Landing. Wow. We had to wait for two and a half hours in a line that was hundreds of people long. That doesn't sound like fun. I'll be honest. You know, when I when we got there, they said, "Look, you can the the they the, the bus had to bring us in. Right. There's just too many cars. You can't let that many cars in." So, what the the whole point of of bringing this up in conversation is they're going to have to start limiting 
the number of people that just go to parks. Yeah. That just go to Glacier, that just go to Yellowstone, that just go to Zion National Park. Yeah. And and there's going to be a permit process and you're going to have to ask permission. You're going to have to plan way ahead. But we got we got there, the bus brought us into Angels Landing hike and they said well, you can go right now if you don't want to climb the last half mile. The last half mile is the part where you know, you've got a you've got like a like a chain handrail. Yeah. And it's 800 <clears throat> feet on either side of that chain handrail. Fun. I mean, it's, it was really fun. It was really cool. And you could see if you if you stumbled and jumped, you could really kill yourself. Yeah. Or I've <laughs> been in situations like that. But but it was, you know, it was fine. And um and so they said or you can get to the long, the end of this line, it's about 2 2 and a half hours and then you can hike that last half mile to Angel's Landing. And I just said, you know what? It'd be just such a waste to come all this way and not take that last half mile. Yeah. So we waited. And it was yeah. okay. It was everybody I, was pretty cool. I uh know a little spot on the rim of the Grand Canyon that has a trail to the bottom. I've been wanting yeah. to go back there. I've hiked it twice. Yeah. We should go. There is I'm down. And you don't have to pay. It's yeah. it's off the beaten path. I, I told you this morning about John Wesley Powell. Yeah. And there's a there's a couple of interesting stories about the Grand Canyon when it was when it was first seen by Westerners. Yeah. To you know the uh, Cortez came up out of Mexico, and yeah. he, he looked at the edge and he asked the natives. He goes, "Hey, hey, what's what's up with this creek down here?" And they go, "That's not a creek. That's a river. You can't even cross that." <laughs> right? He's like, "Whatever." Yeah. He sent some men down. Two days later, they came back and they said, "We never made it to the water." <laughs> Jeez. Honestly. Yeah. Two days later, they go, yeah, it's so big. It's really, really hard to to explain what a massive, uh, yeah. massive canyon that is. So, yeah, I'm down. Yeah. There's petroglyphs down there, too. Really? Yep. So cool. Yeah. So cool. I One of the most, one of the most fantastic things that I see on TikTok are handmade arrowheads. Yeah, guys, dig them up. Flint napping. They have been they have been making arrowheads for thousands of years yeah. on this continent. Thousands of years hunting and killing for thousands of years on this continent, and the ability that some, and I watched some guy make them live. The ability for them to flint nap, yeah, individual tiny little shapes, perfect to 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 wrap. We had an outgoing oh. anthropologist at the college, and I asked yeah. him if he had ever taught flint napping. He goes, "Yeah, I do it every now and then," but he was he was retiring, and so I yeah. I was ready to jump in uh, and say, "Hey, I want to learn some flint napping," but he's gone, and the new anthropologist uh, doesn't do that stuff. So, oh, I'm sure we could find somebody. Yeah, at least I don't know that if she does or not. I, I just have to ask her. There's people on TikTok, does. and there is plenty yeah. of obsidian in the, in the South Hills. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. There's just a matter of uh, there's a, a few tools that you need. A lot of great YouTube videos that people show you how to do. Yeah. It. Uh, I just thought it'd be cool to have somebody that, like him. His name was Jim Woods. Uh, uh -huh. Teach teach me. I think it was Jim Woods. Anyway, uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation hunters purchase uh, a qualifying license in Colorado. Colorado application period for elk. Other big game license open. Well, March first, six days ago. Let's go. It's it's it. This is the very beginning of this of the hunting season. You need to plan your trip. You need to plan your adventure out west. It starts now. Yeah. You should you should be all about it, and you should be practicing your quesadilla skills yeah. too. Yes. Because rehydrated food sucks. <laughs> Other than the potatoes. Other than potatoes, nothing rehydrates like a potato. Can I can I trademark that slogan? <laughs> Maybe today's episode of the Elk Season <laughs> podcast is brought to you by. Idaho and potatoes. Nothing rehydrates like a potato. There we go. You know, uh, coincidentally, because uh, I put it in the wool folder, um, this is the last thing we have in terms of conservation. It's really not conservation, but it was posted by Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks when Big Game was big by Hal Herring. Short-faced bear standing 12 feet tall, massive dire wolves. I uh, thought those only existed on Game of Thrones. And mammoths yeah. weighing up to 10 tons. Hunting Montana. You, are, you you did mention this earlier, but for just... thousands of years, men have hunted on this continent. Yes, and they archery elk is the greatest outdoor sport in North America now. Currently, <laughs> bingo. <laughs> currently, before, can you imagine? Can you imagine the glory of a mammoth you, you takedown? Could, a mammoth Ooh. takedown of a dire wolf of a of a of a short faced bear. Is that what they're called? Yeah. 
12 feet tall. Can you imagine? You need you need four or five buddies to help you with that. Just to, you got to surround them. You need four dogs. or five groups yeah. of four or five buddies. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. So I I do say I do say archery elk is the greatest outdoor sport in North America, which it is currently. Currently, <laughs> but there have been there have been some very very tough others. And I know when I when I tease I tease I talk about your your training wheels. Somebody called my my cams on my bow training wheels. Yeah. In the field yes. while I was hunting. Yep. And I loved it so much <laughs> that That's I just right. knew I knew there's a guy at home flint napping his own arrowheads going, Oh, really? You probably bought that bow, didn't you? Yeah. So you know what? It's <laughs> it's all it's all on a grand uh hierarchy scale, yeah. which I have I have detailed some on my TikTok channel. You can go and find those at Elk Season on TikTok. And I think is that it? Are we done? That, that's it for the conservation. So here we are. We're yeah. just past the top of the hour anyway. So uh yeah, hour and fifteen. All right, that's it for the Elk Season Podcast. Please come back next week. There's more conservation stuff to talk to you about. And you if you have any questions, you want to see us address anything on the Elk Season Podcast, email us Rocky Mountain Elk Season at gmail.com. Be well. Stay awesome. Goodbye. Have a good week. Cheers.